Good morning and welcome to the Vaco pre-conference webinar, Energy Infrastructure Investment for Counties under the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, also known as the IRA. A significant component of the recently passed IRA seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. It does so by making significant investments in climate and environment programs and providing tax incentives to boost the development and deployment of clean energy. These investments include multiple direct funding opportunities for counties to save money while reducing emissions. Today's webinar will provide VACO members with a summary and explanation of how Virginia counties can take advantage of these investments. Our panel of experts will walk us through the basics of the IRA regarding eligible funding opportunities in regards to the deployment of technology and how federal energy tax credits have been significantly modified and increased so that counties can utilize them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Joe Lurch, Director of Local Government Policy, and this is part of our pre-conference webinar. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. Uh, first is Attorney Eric Herlocker, co-founder of Green Herlocker PLC, which provides a broad range of administrative law, business and corporate law, commercial real estate law, employment law, energy law, mergers and acquisitions council, regulatory law, and litigation services throughout the Mid-Atlantic, and, and, uh, and of course, including Virginia. Our second panelist is CPA and attorney Gregory Bryant, founder and managing partner of the Built Group, which provides clients expertise in understanding the nuances of federal tax and accounting law, including the IRA, which is the topic of today's webinar. And then our final panelist is Larry Cummings. Larry Cummings is a regional comprehensive energy leader for TRAIN and manages five states for them. Larry has been chair of VT's Sustainability Institute and president of VCU's uh, College of Engineering Foundation, as well as being on various boards for industry groups. I will now turn this over to Eric Herlocker to get us started, and I will put up the slides. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Joe, and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, be in front of the folks at VACO and, and talk about um, some, some really important legislation that was just passed. Uh, over the summer. And so, um, Joe, if you can maybe go to that first overview slide, uh, the next slide there. Um, so what we're going to try to talk about today and, and kind of keep this um, at, at a relatively high level, there's a lot of, I mean, this was a 750 some page bill uh, that got passed, uh, but but to really kind of focus on the high level issues and and particularly the issues that that will um, that will touch local governments and and the counties here in Virginia uh, and and elsewhere. So um, in looking at, at the panel and and our presentation today, what we're going to talk about is kind of quick as to where we were prior to um, the passage of the in Inflation Reduction Act, and then talk um, a little bit about how prior to the IRA, tax exempt organizations participated in clean energy projects and and this you know there there have been a number of um of localities and schools and so forth in virginia that have already been participating and so we're going to kind of touch a little bit about the where we were and then talk about the ira and and really kind of talk about what it does generally um and then specifically what it does for tax exempt organizations like local governments and also kind of pick up a couple of things of what it doesn't do. Um, so it is not um, in terms of the local government um, uh, aspect, it doesn't solve all the problems, but but it has made some significant strides. And then kind of finish up with, um, you know, what, what really hasn't changed, uh, you know, between where we were in the summer and where we are coming out, you know, here at the end of 2022. And there's a lot of activity that'll be going on next um in terms of regulations and so forth so um to kind of jump in um the next slide please we can talk about just a, a quick summary and kind of get in the time machine all the way back to july of 2022 um and and thinking about where where the clean energy markets were uh at that time prior to um you know, Joe Manchin and others um, kind of coming around and the IRA uh, getting passed in August. So when we when we came in in the summer uh, heading, it looked like heading into the end of the year for the investment tax credit program, 
it was a declining credit uh, program. It had been 30%, it had dropped down to 26%, and it was heading down to 22%. Um, and all a lot of that depended on when your project commenced construction. So um, maybe jump back to, there you go, uh, the, the, that, that slide. Um, and then this whole idea of commence construction, um, you know, has been a little bit of gymnastics in terms of uh, what it means from an IRS and treasury standpoint to have commenced construction. And, and but it was very important because when you commence construction really triggered whether you were in the 30% credit bracket, the 26% bracket, or, you know, were you heading down to the 22% investment tax credit bracket? Um, and, and there were really two two main tests uh, that that were um, that, that Treasury looks at. One is a physical work test. Have you done significant, commenced significant physical work, and are you continuing that work, or have you spent at least five percent of the total project cost, and, and that you know is is kind of has been spent. It's not in the form of refundable deposits or or things like that. So there was a lot of there were a lot of um, activity and structuring and complexity to try to get back into a 30% or a 26% market um, when we were in the summer. Um, there were also limited technologies that were available for the credit. So um, unlike what we'll see in a few minutes when we talk about the IRA and the changes to the both the production tax credit and the investment tax credit, um, you know, for the investment tax credits, there were certain limitations on combined heat and power. It was a 10% credit um, before the IRA. Um, energy storage could not be uh, achieve a credit unless it was kind of co-structured or co-integrated with a solar or wind project. And, and um, things like interconnection costs uh, for certain projects, all of these were not eligible for any tax credit program. Um, there were also restrictions on the production tax credit programs. And, and in the summer of 2022, um, really the, the only PTC um, that was really available and utilized was the wind credit. Uh, that was also a declining credit. Um, no solar activity in the PTC realm uh, in, in the summer. And, and we had PTC values kind of decreasing. Um, <laughs> so it was it was um, it was a little bit of of business as usual, uh, and I think folks um, were almost resigned that this is the way it was going to be, including the limitations that it had on tax exempt organizations who desired to participate in in these kind of clean energy uh, structures. And that kind of leads to the next slide, Joe. So as I mentioned, the tax exempt markets um, have not you know, sat on the sidelines here, uh, you know, even before the IRA, tax exempt entities, uh, local governments, school, schools, and so forth in, in Virginia were, were still active in this market, uh, but they were active kind of as an off taker of services. So they, um, since they could not utilize the credit directly um, at, the, at the time, they had to uh, rely on the private market and, and structures that allowed the private market entities to get the advantages of the tax credit programs. And really uh, two models uh, emerged, have, have emerged in Virginia on that front. Uh, one was a power purchase a PPA model. Um, and under this model, I won't go through everything, but basically somebody builds, owns and operates a facility, a uh, solar facility on your property. Um, the, the, the local government's property sells the power as it is generated to the um, to the locality. And um, there are certain provisions where after the, the recapture period, uh, a tax credit um, period of five or six years that the localities at that point may may look at purchasing a facility if your power purchase agreement uh, uh, contemplates that. So. That was one structure. The other structure that we saw were kind of service agreements, which were a, a little bit of hybrids between the PPAs and, and kind of a standard lease uh, where localities would pay a fixed monthly 
service fee and in, in exchange for that, they would have somebody own, operate and provide them uh, inter clean energy services. And then that would include um, you know, the, the energy that was created or generated by a solar facility, a wind facility um, were, were the two. And, and frankly, in Virginia, it was really had just been solar. Uh, and again, a lot of the, the, the same um, O&M and, and responsibilities, all those fell on the private entity and the local governments uh, were really just kind of off takers of the of the power and and you know the idea there was that due to the credits and the tax benefits uh, available to the private market, the power or the services would be available to the off take local government at a price you know hopefully slightly below uh, the the alternative price of the of their utility service. Um, so that's kind of where we were and and maybe this is probably a good place maybe to turn it over to Greg um, and, and let Greg kind of get, give an overview and, and some of the key takeaways from the IRA and, and, and walk through some of those provisions. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Eric. That was a great introduction and um, really, you know, tells us exactly where we've been navigating from. And, uh, and, and, and Joe, thanks for inviting us to, to join you on this too. I really appreciate it. We, um, Eric and I work in tandem on these because it does take a lot of structuring um, and you have different players. So you always have to make sure that, you know, all the pieces fit together. Um, but a lot's changed now um, <laughs> to be speaking to governments and tax exempt organizations about investment tax credits is a very unique experience for me because generally they're not people who are interested in these things, but a lot changed with the inflation reduction act. Um, and in all fairness, people call it IRA or the IRA because there's very, it's fundamentally, it is a green energy act. It is, uh, it is a, a, a sort of small version of build back better. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of um, incentives now for renewable energy and it's been expanded greatly. Um, and this is kind of a summary of what they are. First is, as Eric pointed out, the tax credit went back up to 30%. It was actually on its way to 10%. I guess our slide should have said after 22, it was dropping to 10. Um, but, you know, it was definitely phasing out and now it's back and it's back a lot stronger because now it's 30 to 40%. And we'll talk a lot about the difference, you know, how do you get the higher rates or the higher benefits but largely that's because of certain social justice and features to the bill that get you um, more benefits if you invest in opportunity opportunity zones and different economically blighted areas that are, are yet to be defined. So we have always we have found that a lot of times the government investments and exempt orgs tend to be located in those areas. And so we'll talk about the bigger benefits, but the, but the benefits went up significantly. And that means approximately 50 to 55% of the cost of building renewable energy production and has been broadened. I, I tend to be biased towards, towards solar because, hold on, let me turn that on, because uh, we've done a lot of solar, but it has been expanded to wind, bio uh, mass, um, all kinds, of, and it, it will eventually be completely technology neutral. Um, it could even be coal production if you had carbon uh, capture, um, but it'll get to 50 to 55% of the cost is actually funded with refundable credits or transferable credits. You can actually sell them. So and you're gonna hear me talk about this a lot more further on there are more paths to monetizing the tax benefits. And that's why we're talking to this group because historically exempt orgs don't have any way of harvesting or monetizing investment tax credits or production tax credits because they don't have income that's taxable. And if they do, you know, they're generally trying to manage around what's called unrelated business income tax. But now, these credits are as if you had not paid that into Treasury. They will give you that money back at the end of the year. And if you, if you want the money before then, you can actually sell these credits. And I expect we will see something like uh, credit exchanges popping up the way we did with uh, renewable energy credits in the past. 
So there are a lot more paths now to monetizing it. And that's why you don't need to have taxable income in order to get the benefits now that are under the IRA. Um, because of the increased benefits, because there are more ways to monetize it, uh, and because the expansion of, um, of investors. I mean, historically, when Eric and I are putting deals together, there are two things that are, tend to be big obstacles. One is finding an off taker because you're always kind of, you know, competing on what that rate will be. And the other one is finding what are called tax equity investors. Um, and that's a pretty small pool. And because individuals tend to run into what were called passive activity loss rules and exempt orgs didn't have any way of harvesting the benefits. That has all changed. And now you have a, a individuals and exempt orgs can get the benefits from this. And so the pool of investors has expanded significantly. Additionally, because of the monetization and the ability to monetize these credits faster, the break even on, a, on an investment has gone from 15 to 20 years down to seven to eight years. And we'll show uh, an illustration of that later on in this presentation. So that is a significant um, improvement. It's, it's basically cut your, your break even in half. Let's go to the next slide, please, Jim. Okay, we're gonna jump into some of the details here and I'm gonna go over here because I cannot even think about seeing this slide. Okay, so now we have until the end of 2024, we have a set of rules and then beginning in 2025, a new set jumps in. And I'll just kind of highlight the big difference. The difference is until the end of 2024, there's more um, technology specific uh, investment tax credits and what are called production tax credits. And, and that means, you know, in my example, the uh, coal production that has carbon um, capture, that wouldn't qualify under this um, until 2025, which will then become completely technology agnostic. But they did expand retroactively the credit to 30%. Um, and this credit uh, can go up to 40% if you put, go in opportunity zones and it will be a refundable credit. So a lot has changed and, um, and you got, now you can get it for uh, fiber optic solar, fuel cell properties, micro turbine, small wind uh, properties, um, all kinds of different uh, expansion now. And, and so that's a big improvement over what we currently had, and, and it'll get better. So coming in 2025, it'll change into a different type of credit, which I'm about to talk about, but you'll also have to choose between what are called production tax credits and investment tax credits. The new regime starting in 2025 is completely, doesn't care about the technology, it's, it's technology neutral, um, it's fundamentally the same credit. It's the 30 and 40%. Um, there is, uh, to get a, the full 30%, there will be some type of work program that you'll have to commit to. And what I mean by that, there's, uh, there, there are yet rules to come out as to what the wages have to be, and you have to have an apprenticeship feature to your, to any sort of um, development of, of renewable. Uh, and you'll have 60 days to come in compliance after those rules come out. So everybody right now is marching forward with the understanding they will get the 30 or 40% credit. And the, and the difference is the 40% credit is dependent on where you're making that investment and opportunity zones, for example, would, would get you the higher um, benefits. Um, and then you have today what's called the Advanced Energy Production Credit. Um, this is a credit regime that um, was not available to solar. Uh, now it is, um, and uh, it's been expanded uh, as well. Um, and it is um, a credit that is based on how much energy production you have. And we'll show an illustration later of how that interplays with the investment tax credit. But um, there are, I'm sure, examples where this would be a better op opportunity or a, a you know, long-term benefit than possibly the ITC. And I'll show you how that works. 
going forward is starting in 2025, you'll have to, um, actually, I'll just, I'll, I'll stick with this for a second. This is a comparison of the existing rule uh, to the future rule. Um, and really they're very, very similar, except that going forward again, it will become technology agnostic and you can just um, take the credit and it goes up a little bit. Um, today it's uh, 2.6 cents a, a kilowatt hour. It'll go up to 2.75 or something like that. And it, there's a range depending, now there's a range depending on um, what type of renewable you're doing in the future, there won't be a range. So, um, and we'll do an illustration of that. Um, and then here are some of the other credits that are out there that are really around community investment and social justice. And uh, there are rules yet to be defined. Um, they tend to be working off of certain budget caps, like the uh, new markets credits were. Um, and, you know, we're going to follow this further, but uh, it's a little, bit, there's really not much we can say other than that last point that you can see you get a 40% tax credit if you end up investing in economically disadvantaged communities. And I expect that will be um, opportunity zones and uh, also um, Native American tribal land. Yeah, just uh, if I could uh, just jump in just a, sure. uh, a minute as we, with the slides will catch up here. Um, but one of the other one of the other things that you know is of interest to to folks is that a lot of a lot of times and and at times a lot of money uh, is spent interconnecting these um, clean energy facilities to the grid. Um, or to a, you know, or into a, a meter for a facility or a locality. Um, and the, one of the nice features of this, uh, of this act is that, um, unlike in the past where you incurred those costs, but you got no credit, you know, no credit for them. Um, now, if your projects are under five megawatts, um, you are, you are able to, um, you are able to include in your in your determination of your cost that that and this this is in the investment tax credit uh, structure. You can include in your in your costs that go into that thirty or forty percent credit calculation um, the cost that you've incurred to interconnect your facilities or do up or have the utility do upgrades to its facilities to accommodate your system. Um, so there there are these incremental pieces of of this and as as Greg noted you know when you kind of put all these pieces and you know it, and they're not all going to be available for every project but when you start stacking them up uh it, it really does become uh a, a pretty lucrative uh credit program that that localities you know can now begin to you know can, can begin to 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 take uh take into consideration as they're making you know, capital and other other decisions. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, kind of chime in that that there are there are these other issues or other credit enhancement opportunities that as as you and your your management get into the you know looking at these facilities, um, you, you're really want going to want to pay attention to. And hey, Greg, there, when you when you put these deals together, they're they're you. There's two kinds of costs. There's the cost if you're the builder yourself, and then there's the cost if you buy a, a working functioning um, grid or, or uh, energy production facility. And, and the distinction is in the second one, you have a purchase price that then has to be allocated across the asset base. In, in the first example, where you're building it yourself, you have receipts that tell you exactly what your costs are for every component and every, and every piece of equipment. And the interconnect was considered something that was not credit eligible. Other things that are not credit eligible are uh, site prep and, and uh, land costs, uh, fencing, you know, things like that. So, um, but when you buy it as a completed unit, there's actually, you know, you have to hire somebody who's like an engineer, does a cost segregation study and will come up with a completely different uh, number than the actual cost. Because in all likelihood, somebody sold it to you at a profit. So. Um, so it's a very different dynamic and, you know, I expect this audience that we're talking to will largely be building their own facilities now that they can monetize so many of the benefits. But as we'll talk later, not all the benefits go to exempt orgs like accelerated depreciation. 
and we may still be doing the kind of planning we've done in the past, Eric, and, uh, yep. you know, pass on the benefits indirectly. Um, hey, Eric, so can we Eric, go to the Eric, next slide? Yeah, uh, can we figure out which slide we're going to be on? I think I might have been a little off. Yeah, I noticed that because I was looking. We can just go to the next slide, Joe. I'm only next one. Slide? Ahead. Okay, yeah. Sorry. All right. I only jumped one ahead of you, okay? I already okay. talked about this one, but these are just the added incentives. And what I was talking about um, just before Eric was uh, the 40% investment tax credit regime that is available under opportunity zones. We can go to the next slide, Jeff. Thanks. So let's do a bit of a deep dive um, into the investment tax credit. Um, this is a bit of, you know, the CPA world, but, um, you know, it is uh, based on certain property. I just talked about certain property that wouldn't qualify like land improvement costs and grading and things like that. Um, a lot of your soft costs historically didn't don't qualify, but now the interconnect does, which is a big expense. Um, the ITC was extended, uh, you know, for most con all new construction. So that's, you know, everybody right now who was worried about losing the benefits and trying to get their projects you know, at least considered started in 2022 now are not worried about it. Um, and, you know, you file it on a form 3468 and uh, next thing you know, it's treated right now under this regime as if whatever that credit is, it's as if you had cut a check to treasury that needs to be refunded. So they will refund it. You can go to the next slide. This is really important, okay? One of the things that you will see in the models and the example we have that follows is that monetizing the benefits is what drives the, um, the return on investment and the payback. And historically, if you couldn't get monetized the benefits up front, either with tax equity and other things, then the payback would generally get longer and longer. You would take... Uh, deals that had a return on investment of 16 to 20 percent, and they would immediately drop to 7 percent because the longer it takes to turn that investment tax credit or production tax credit into cash, um, the, the less valuable that cash becomes. And, you know, so if you're extending it out 15 years, that dollar in 15 years is worth a lot less than that dollar is today. And so that is what has changed significantly. This tax refund mechanism is designed to get you that benefit right away. And, if, and, and, and so when I say right away, you have to file a return and then Treasury has to cut a refund check. So it could be a year or a year and a half out unless you want to try to sell your credit before you wait to get it back from Treasury. And I do expect that there will be some sort of, you know, um, exchanges popping up that will allow you to do that pretty effortlessly. But this is a big deal because without this direct credit and refund mechanism, um, we wouldn't be talking to you about this. That's so, right. Uh, okay, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Transferability, um, you know, I think that kind of speaks for itself, right? You, you'll be able to sell it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is uh, something that we're going to have to probably work into the structuring and we'll use like a third party because again, exempt orgs don't get to sell, um, their credits. You have to wait for the refund mechanism as an exempt org, but, um, it must be a sale for cash and so on. So I'm waiting for the regs to come out. That'll actually give us a lot more clarity as to how this is going to work. Um, this is something that. I think it's long overdue personally. I mean, you know, I recall back in uh, 2008 when, you know, companies were going, getting bailed out by the government. A lot of those companies had large tax attributes that they could have sold. And, you know, they, if there was a way to have transferred them, you could have, you know, avoided a lot of the mechanisms that were used. Um, and I think it's a great idea to um, have a, a feature like this um, because, you um, that's always been a challenge with our projects. There are a lot of benefits out there, but there's only a small pool of tax equity that can use them. This has changed. We can go to the next uh, slide, Jeff. I, I don't know, Eric, you almost want to speak to this one more than I do. Sure. I think, but, uh, yeah, no, that, that, that's fine. I'll kind of jump in here. Um, yeah, and this is kind of, you know, in, in some respects, a little bit of a summary, but, but the one, um, of what of what Greg has just kind of talked about, 
the, the, the one thing that I did want to point out and another feature of the IRA that is the, you know, that is potentially very helpful for uh, tax exempt organizations and, and lo local governments as they think about how they would fund and, and, and do these transactions uh, or do these, um, the, these projects is that, you know, now under this new rule, you, a, a locality could issue 100% of the financing for a project using uh, tax exempt financing. And the haircut that it would take it, it is limited now to 15%. So if you are, if, if a lo local government were to finance, you know, a, 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 a project 100% with tax exempt bonds uh, or other financing, um, it would it would be able to claim 85 percent of as a as direct pay of the 30 percent or 40 percent tax credit that it was entitled to, and so it really is uh, incenting uh, local governments uh, to 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 look at this path and look at this path very closely um, uh, as it as it begins to think about ways to deploy capital and how to how to efficiently deploy it. Um, there, there are, um, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, issues that, that Greg touched upon, you know, the tax exempts don't, uh, aren't able to claim the accelerated depreciation like a, a private investor or a private entity would, uh, but still the direct pay in co combination with the ability to, to significantly utilize the tax exempt financing markets are, are going to really, I think, make it very attractive. Uh, for for local governments as they as they begin to look at uh, the, these type of clean energy projects and and importantly and you know we'll you know we kind of leave Larry hanging out here to the end but you know a, a lot of these projects you, you know aren't you know aren't just strictly you know the the traditional renewables I mean you've got CHPs and fuel cells and heat re waste recovery program projects and and so the the you know the types of 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 technologies, you know, near term and long term that may be available uh, for this type of credit program is, it, you know, is really going to be pretty significant for local governments as they begin to plan their resiliency models. How do they most efficiently serve local government campuses and so forth, um, you know, uh, you know, going forward and doing their long range planning. Um, so that, that thanks, Greg. I, Jump, jump back over. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so the going forward, the question um, investors will have to answer is which credit do I go after the investment tax credit or the production tax credit? Um, and they're, they are very different. Um, and, um, and I'm going to show in the next slides here how they work. Um, and this is a super simple example, okay? Because um, you know Larry's going to go. Where did you get uh, ten cents per kilowatt? Because that's like you know maybe uh, Louisiana has that rate, but um, I'm just trying to use easy math here, okay? So <laughs> I think the national average is about sixteen cents. So you, you actually get a you know better return. And I got you know I, I don't see energy prices coming down, so um, I'm building a five percent inflation rate in here too. And this is an example of a uh, uh, energy production. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll say solar for now because that's I'm more familiar with it. Um, and it costs three million dollars to build a uh, two thousand um, megawatt. I guess is what I have here megawatt uh, um, facility that uh, you know is. Uh, anyways, let's go. Ninety five percent of it qualifies for the credit. Um, so, what you see here is kind of the monetization feature that I was referring to. Hold on. So, uh, if you're producing that energy, your deferred cost, your, your avoided cost is 200,000 a year. That's 10 cents times 2,000. And it's going up, so you, you get a benefit, your benefit increases as energy costs go up. Now, what's happened here, if you take the investment tax credit is, you're getting 40%, I'm assuming 40%, because this is the maximum credit you could get. And that's if you're in an opportunity zone, for example, you would get $1.1 million back in the first year. 
And so that puts your net cost at 1,860,000 in this example. And at the cost savings, your break even is roughly seven years, 10 months, and your return on investment on the net cost is 11 going up to 15%. And the reason that, you know, kind of looks shorter than the next example is you're harvesting a lot of monetizing a lot of the benefits sooner with the investment tax credit. When we go to the next example, you see that over a 10 year period, this is the production tax credit, your, your revenue or your, your avoided costs are exactly the same, but your credit that comes in gradually and it's coming in at $55,000 a year. So um, it takes longer to get that monetized. And as a result of that, um, you are, uh, and then as well, um, you know, your, your cost is $3 million, not a net of 1.8. So it ends up dragging out a little longer in this example, and, and you would end up at about 10 years, nine years, eight months to break even. Um, which, you know, by my experience with government investing, that's still a pretty good number. Um, but the investment tax credit, at least in this example, um, illustrates, you know, a higher benefit or a little bit better benefit. And it's all because you're monetizing that benefit quicker under this example. Okay, and then I, tr I ran it out using a 30% credit instead of 40 because um, that just gives you, shows you that it, it probably knocks it out another year. If you go to the next slide, Joe. So go back one more. Go the other way, there you go. So this is just the same example. Uh, oh, I have one with, there was a 30 and a, isn't there a 30% in there or did we take it? There you go. There, thank you. This is exact same example, except with a 30% credit. And what you see is the production tax credit example doesn't change, but the other one pushes out another year if you hit your break even. Okay, now we can go to the next slide, Jeff. Sorry. So, so I'll talk just you know kind of to, to um, close the the loop here on um, you know what what really hasn't changed, and and so you know the the fact that some of the you know the direct pay opportunities are now available for uh, tax exempt organizations, uh, local governments. It does, this doesn't mean this is the only way to do these deals. And so uh, some of the things that, that we talked about at the very beginning as to how clean energy transactions and clean energy deals were getting done uh, prior to the IRA, you know, still, you know, those, those things are still out there. And so, um, you know, there are governments uh, and tax exempt organizations that just don't want to expend their own capital in this sector or for this use. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it, you know we, the, the opportunities to do the other structures are still there. And in fact, um, they may even be more attractive after the IRA because, you know, it, if, it, if it got, if it got um, more attractive for the tax exempt community, uh, it absolutely got more attractive for the private uh, tax paying in, uh, community. So the things like the PPA structures uh, are still, you know, are, are still ones that, that local governments may want to consider. And, you know, the benefits there are, you know, you, you just kind of pay what you get. Uh, you don't have the O&M, you don't worry about the performance. Some, that's somebody else's problem. And as you get kilowatt hours, you pay for them. Uh, similar structures, service agreements, you know, you've got kind of a defined monthly payment, and as long as everything you know is going well, you pay for that service, and and um, is, is there similar benefits? Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of not give the you know leave with a, a, an idea that after the IRA, all those other types of transactions aren't available. Um, they still are. And uh, it, uh, really what the IRA does is, is, is expanded the, the ways in which local governments and other tax exempt organizations might be able to participate. Um, there, and I, I think Greg can maybe touch briefly on what's next. And, and the, the what's next, I think, is going to be a lot of 
you know, guidance documentation and answering, you know, notwithstanding the fact that it was 750 pages of legislation, there was a lot that wasn't said and a lot of nuance to things um, that that needs to be, um, you know, that, that needs to get fleshed out and that will, you know, get fleshed out here over the next year, I expect. But um, Greg, maybe pick up with where where the Treasury is on on legislation on, on regulations and guidance documentation and what we might expect there. Right now, they, they've sent out question. They've sent out a request for comments. Um, we might see draft regulations on wages and internships this summer. Um, no, November 12th is the last day for the commissioner Reddick. <laughs> uh, you know, they're going through a lot of transition right now. Um, part of the IRA is to fund 87,000 new agents. Um, and uh, they're going to be onboarding a lot of new people. Um, so it's hard to put a, a timeline on it um, because I'm not sure how they're going to deploy those 87,000. Um, but this is a, obviously a priority. And the industry, at least, is running forward um, with the expectation that we will be able to harvest the credits as we understand it. And when the guidance comes out, we can fix it as we go. But yeah, so there's a lot of turmoil right now. Of course, you know, the election could could change a lot of this too. There's, you know, uh, if there's a, trans, a turnover of parties in the House and or Senate, it could change a lot of how this act gets uh, implemented. Great. So yeah, so we, I, I think at the end of here, we, Greg and I provide our contact information. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there are, Probably many more questions that you have than we've answered, uh, but feel free to you know to reach out from a you know from a tax and and structuring uh, standpoint um, if you have questions uh, to either of us. And like Greg said, we work pretty closely together, and and we'll uh, we'll get back uh, efficiently with folks. And I think now you know it 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 really makes sense to kind of take the 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 tax and 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 structure and theories and talk about, uh, you know, have Larry kind of give us, you know, what's really happening here because none of these machines make tax credits. Uh, what they really do is produce energy and transmit and distribute energy. Uh, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what, you know, y'all are looking for um, and, and ways to, you know, support your systems and, and make your systems more resilient and, and so forth. So Larry, maybe, uh, um, you can uh, give give the actual information that folks are paying to see here. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Welcome all the VACO members. Uh, so you've heard some from some experts around many of the technical aspects of the IRA. Uh, I'm going to talk about the sexy stuff. Uh, Train is the largest provider of energy related projects within the public sector in the region that I manage, which is Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia. North and South Carolina. And our clients utilize performance contracting and turnkey uh, to do many of these projects. Um, so just give you a sense of some context here. Over half of Virginia K through 12 schools have used performance contracting to address their deferred maintenance. So PC, for those that may not be familiar with it, is a process that identifies energy savings via an energy audit to create a scope of work um, that pays for itself. So we usually see lighting projects, envelope, building envelope, various HVAC infrastructure. Um, and just another point of reference for you. Um, we perform projects for the majority of state agencies in Virginia, and these are departments that either you're familiar with or that your departments are working with. So for example, we've done projects at state police, uh, Department of General Services, the Monroe Building in downtown Richmond. Uh, we did a PC project there, the DMV headquarters on Broad Street, uh, the Virginia Retirement System. We just finished changing out 10,000 highway lights for VDOT, uh, all to LED. We've touched all the mental health campuses across the Commonwealth, done work for corrections and for the Department of Forensics. So uh, your peers of these other public bodies are using these as tools. So what I'd like to do is kind of share, if we take what the IRA allows us you to do, I wanna share some project examples that 
that might be in your capital plan or they may be something that you're thinking about. So I just want to provide some examples uh, that other public sectors um, are using. So solar and PV is very common. Uh, my guess is that you've looked at it, you've done it, uh, and or your school system has. Uh, so we did a large PV project for the Virginia Department of General Services on their buildings and for the 14th Street parking deck. Uh, we're currently working with the City of Roanoke Schools on um, their PV project. Also, another very common um, project is solar hot water. Uh, so we've done a large installation for Knox County government in Tennessee. Uh, and it has, you know, solar hot water has good applications for large 24 seven populations, such as your prisons or hospitals or universities. Another example um, that I want to share with you, this is becoming a little bit more common is geothermal. Um, so we did a large uh, Navy base project for Oceana. Uh, they had a lot of outdoor rooftop units that were prematurely decaying and basically falling apart a lot quicker because of the salty conditions down in Tidewater, Virginia. So with them, we created a project that drilled 210 geothermal wells, basically bringing all their exterior in HVA infrastructure inside uh, to protect it. Uh, we did a similar project at Dan Naval Base next door, where we tapped into the six foot the fluid pipe um, that the Hampton Road Sanitation Department had going across the campus. So we did a heat sink, tapped into that, and then supplemented that heat sink with 64 other wells that we drilled. Um, that project received the Presidential Award for the Best Energy Project in the military that year, and both the Navy and train were invited to the White House for recognition. Um, another approach was a biomass boiler. So partnering with the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health, uh, we successfully designed a biomass boiler uh, plan for Piedmont Geriatric. So they had an older boiler there that was using salt dust. So we complemented it and supplemented it by putting in a boiler that could use switchgrass or sawdust. Um, and so we also helped the um, Piedmont Geri Geriatric staff to identify and contract with local farmers to supply switchgrass. So very creatively. Um, I'm gonna provide four examples of this next technology for you because I use different uh, fuel sources. Uh, and that is cogeneration. And I think the guys talked about this a little bit earlier. So we've designed and we'll be installing a combined heat and power project for Radford University in 2023, utilizing natural gas a line that is near their campus. Uh, they will have the ability to produce um, all of their own power needs. In essence, they can go completely off the grid. Uh, there are several factors influencing the school to do this. And one of the more critical conditions was that the last three or four years, they've seen their enrollment decrease uh, over that period of time. Uh, and it's not unusual because there is a trend now in higher education where you have less 18 year olds graduating from high school um, in the most recent years, and that'll occur for the next eight years. So putting a lot of pressure on balance sheets for higher education. And so they saw this trend, they were living the trend. Um, and so this was a financial decision because it um, strengthens their balance sheet going forward because they're saving so much money because of the code gen. Um, another creative project we did uh, or will be, uh, excuse me, we did was Bud and Let uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility in Washington, in the state of Washington. Basically, we leveraged the methane and the digester as the fuel source to power their combined heat and power plant. A third example is a large one out in Misawa Air Base in Japan, uh, where we are building a 6.5 megawatt combined heat and power plant with a 7.5 a megawatt PV project and microgrid. So you can see how you can uh, interrelate and connect all these different um, renewable infrastructure. And the last example is one of your peers down in Georgia, uh, Clayton County, Georgia, used methane from their landfill to power their combined heat and power. Uh, so those are some really good examples. Um, and another one, we've done a PV with battery storage at five different installations for the US uh, Forest Service. Um, 
And then something that was a trend went away and maybe coming back is large scale ice storage uh, for your chiller plants. And we've just done a huge um, project for the University of Arizona, if that's something you'd like to learn about. And just lastly, I'll just comment on, um, we're having more and more conversations uh, with universities and large building owners around chiller plants, boiler plants, and uh, as I mentioned, cogen earlier. So on chiller plants, we built and manage all of Virginia Tech's 17 chiller plants. Uh, and so they have found that to be much more effective uh, doing that versus a dedicated building cooling system. And so we're having more and more of those discussions. So I thought it'd be appropriate to kind of share these examples. So as you're thinking through the IRA and how it could apply to you, these are the types of projects uh, that you could benefit from. And they would be good outside of the IRA, but with the IRA, they become wonderful projects that pay for themselves much quicker. And so if you're looking at uh, the amount of deferred maintenance you have, or if you're looking to redesign some of your systems, now may be a good time to do it. So, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you or Eric, whoever wants to take it from here. Yeah, no, I thank you, Larry. And one of the things, Larry, we're going to do is we're going to have your contact information on the YouTube webinar page uh, and along with the slides that everybody saw. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to comment on is I can think of, of two groups that we're going to want to share this webinar with. One is the Virginia Energy um, uh, Purchasing Governmental Association, and that's the group uh, within the Dominion Service Territory um, that consists of uh, finance officers and energy managers for a lot of our members. And I think they'd be really interested in these opportunities, as well as the Virginia Government Finance Officers um, Association, because I think they'll be really interested in the financing piece and the tax piece. Um, one of the things that I found interesting, and hopefully have a, a few minutes, uh, was, and I'll take the example of biomass, which now seems to be opened up here under the IRA and the example you gave Larry and, and a question for Eric. Um, I was at a presentation recently where Virginia secretary of, uh, forest and ag Matt Lore was talking about the Virginia, uh, clean energy act VCEA. And 1 of the things that it doesn't account for is biomass as a source of, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so I'm starting to wonder with that example, do you see things that Virginia passed under VCEA that may need to be amended to align with the IRA to help position Virginia better, including Virginia's local governments? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Joe, as we were as we were kind of talking, particularly as Larry was talking at the end, I was kind of going through my mind. You know, the the other thing in you know for Virginia localities is you know, what's still a relatively recent VCEA uh, that that is incenting and, and promoting uh, a, a, a relatively rapid um, uh, move to uh, renewable and, and, and non-carbon emitting uh, technologies. Uh, so I, I think the answer is, is yes. I think what's going to be interesting in this session, particularly, it, you know, it, given the, um, Given uh, the Governor Yunkin's energy plan that was announced, um, it is kind of looking at initially what bills get you know put in from the from the administration to affect uh, what what uh, the governor has laid out in the energy plan, and then looking at those bills and deciding where do we need to you know kind of piggyback or add uh, address things that that kind of mesh the the, the tax credit program and the VCEA programs, uh, you know, because one of the things that Virginia has got to think about is that, you know, people are going to throughout the country are going to uh, utilize the IRA and the tax benefits that come from it. Um, you know, if Virginia doesn't do its full share, Virginians still get to pay for, you know, the guys in Arizona and Illinois and Texas. Um, you know that that are utilizing it. Um, if if we're not, so I I think you know to your point, we we will want to look at the bills that get introduced and, and look at ways to to kind of line up the incentives in the IRA that came two years after the VCEA and make sure that you know Virginia is getting you know it's good bang for its buck here. That's great. Um, 
I got one other question and then maybe we'll wrap it up for final comments from the three of you. Um, Greg, it was really interesting, um, and I think Eric pointed out too, that under five megawatts, how that's changing the game plan, because this, this is going to be a lot of these projects maybe for, for county governments and the, you know, now being able to do the interconnection costs. Um, you mentioned the, the, I guess, the IRA rules. Will there be an opportunity to to look at draft rules and provide comments to to so that local governments looking at them could say, "Hey, could we tweak it this way to to be more seamless?" Yes, there, there's an opportunity now to, and I can share it with the group. Uh, what the IRS asked for comments and about the um, labor features to the credit, um, but we they generally will come out with proposed regulations, and there is a usually a period of six months to for the public to comment for groups like yours to comment and uh you know then they then they listen to those you'll usually see them you know they'll consider all those comments actually yeah and i have to imagine too that the national association of counties NACOs, is on top of this and will be probably giving um our members uh, notice as well you know, this is again to me, this is a kind of a unique area for exempt orgs and governments to be in. This is, I, mean, I don't usually find you in the tax credit sandbox. So um, I wouldn't assume that necessarily, Joe. I think it'd be good to ask the questions. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Well, you know, with that, I think we, we're, we're right at about an hour or, or so. Right. so any, any final comments from the three of you? I'll start with Eric. Yeah, I just, I, I guess the, the comment I have is that, you know, there's a lot still to get deciphered here, but, uh, but the, the key is, you know, kind of starting your planning and your thinking now, because it's going to take time. Uh, the other, you know, kind of the other headwind, at least in, initially that the, you know, a lot of the energy sector is facing is just supply chain issues, you know, be it solar or turbines or transformers. Um, you know, there, there is, uh, there is a lot of demand now. And so, you know, the 1 thing that that. The private industry needs to do and the tax exempt uh, industry needs to do is start making plans and start making, you know, kind of firm commitments on those plans because it's going to take some time. We're still shaking off a little bit of the pandemic um, supply chain issues. And, and and so you know we you don't want to delay um, uh, more than you need to here and and because uh, there's there's other factors that that are going to slow you down so start thinking now is kind of our advice. Greg, I think there's a, a, a great opportunity here to kind of well, you can view these credits if you would especially the investment tax credit as a form of grant to help you build these renewable projects. Uh, Eric and I have seen, you know, a lot of interest in renewables by schools and and hospitals and, you know, a lot of exempt orgs, but they just didn't know how to finance it and how to put deals together. Now, the, the opportunities and the horizons gotten a lot wider. And I think, um, you know, we can put more deals together. We, you know, I mean, they're, this is what we do. I think we've gotten uh, more opportunities now and more investors are coming to the table. Great. Thanks. Larry, wrap us up. Yeah, and I'll just kind of piggyback on Eric's thoughts that um, there is a short time frame, if you will, uh, relatively speaking. And so designing and pricing these out and getting a feel for that, that's where we can help our uh, the VACO uh, members, if you will. And I'll also say that train and our partners are willing to do concession agreements whereby we will own the asset. Uh, so we're willing to look at those creative relationships or opportunities as well. So look forward to talking to the various public bodies and uh, seeing how we can help. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, very much the, the three of you for today. This was, uh, there's a lot here and, and what's great is we have the slides and we've got your contact information. So I, I expect you'll, you'll be hearing from some of our members. So once again, thank you. And uh, we will end the recording now. Great. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Bye, Larry. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.